Well, that goes to the heart of the issue. What love is this? God is love. And you can get in lengthy discussions with Calvinists, and you can go round and round on the finer points of doctrine. Let me just point this out. The bottom line, what all of their arguments are aimed at is to prove to you that God does not love everyone, that God does not want everyone in heaven, that Christ did not die for everyone, but that, in fact, God is pleased to damn millions, and you would have to say billions, to hell. Now, when I say to the Calvinists, uh, I talk about uh, a, a relatively few elect, the Calvinist says, no, no, we don't mean few elect. I mean, uh, there's a great multitude in heaven. That's what the Bible says of every tribe and tongue. Well, yes, but I say, look, don't jump on me for saying that. Jesus said it, didn't he? Didn't they ask him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Jesus said, strive to enter at the, at the straight gate. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Now you've got two choices. Either the broad road filled with people on their way to hell is because they have made a choice of their own free will. And they have rejected a gospel that they could have believed if they wanted to. Or God predestined them to go to hell. And the vast majority of mankind, this broad road, is because God predestined them from eternity past. And that's what Calvinism teaches. And John Calvin said, it is to the glory of God. It is his good pleasure that he damns so many. So we have to decide. And this is... This is the, uh, the issue, in essence. Does God love everyone? God is love, the Bible says. It tells us his tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm eighty six fifteen. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. And he requires us to be the same, does he not? Didn't Jesus say, be ye merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful? But if my heavenly Father is only merciful to certain ones, then I can be only merciful to certain ones, right? If I'm to be merciful as my heavenly Father is merciful. But Micah 6, 8 says that I am to love mercy. And uh, Micah uh, 7.18 says that God delighteth in mercy. Ephesians 2.4 says he is rich in mercy. And I quoted already Psalm 145.9. His tender mercies are over all his works. And Romans 11.32 tells us that God has pronounced both Jew and Gentile, quote, all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. I believe that the Bible teaches that God loves everyone. He's not willing that any should perish. Now the Calvinist says, no, that means he's not willing that any of the elect should perish. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, you know it well, love is kind. Love is kind. How can you interpret predestining multitudes to eternal torment as being kind. That's not a matter of God's sovereignty, you understand. God has the right to send anybody to hell that he wants to, right? We would agree with that. He's sovereign. I can't argue. In fact, we all deserve to go to hell, right? That's not the issue. The issue is, is God kind? Is he loving? Uh, I don't think it's loving to send people to hell predestine them to go to hell. They can't even believe the gospel. They don't have a chance. Well, we'll get more into that. I think it's a misrepresentation of, of God. 
Listen to J.I. Packer. Quote, God loves all in some ways. Everyone whom he creates receives many undeserved good gifts. He loves some in all ways. That is, he brings them to faith, to new life, and to glory according to his predestinating purpose. The Calvinist uh, tries to say, uh, well, let me quote a British editor. I, 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 editor, you would know him. I'm not going to give his name. He wrote to me a bit angrily. He said, quote, the plain truth is that God does not wish to save all men. If he did, then he would save them. Now, the Calvinists would say, now, wait a minute. You mean to say that someone can... Uh, you mean to say that it is God's will? He, would, he wants all, all to be saved? That's what the Bible says. And you mean to say that man can frustrate God's will? Well, they do it all the time. Jesus said that the Pharisees had rebelled against God. Who keeps the Ten Commandments? They weren't ten suggestions. Didn't God intend that man should keep these? Wouldn't you say that that would be God's will? But people go against God's will continually. Why would Jesus say to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if God's will is already being done here? What would be the point? Uh, and, and Paul... Well, you know what he said in Romans chapter 9. He said, I could wish myself accursed of God for my brethren, the Jews. Isn't that what Paul said? Didn't Paul say, I would go to hell for them. If that would save the Jews, I would be willing to go to hell myself. I don't know that any of us could say that. But that's what Paul said. Where did he get this love? Where did he get this compassion? For mankind. Now understand, wouldn't it be blasphemy for Paul to be concerned about the salvation of people that God had already predestined to eternal damnation? Paul, how can you do this in the face of God, who says it is for his good pleasure? that he has damned most of these people. And you say you would be willing to die? You would be willing to suffer eternally for them? Paul, how could you do this? You're going against God. You see, you can't really show concern and compassion for anyone who's not one of the elect because God has no concern or compassion for any of them. And in the book, we quote Jay Adams, for example, uh, in his book, competent to counsel. I mean, Jay Adams is, is a friend, uh, and we offer that book. But in that book, he says, the counselor cannot say to the counselee, Christ died for you, because you don't know whether he's one of the elect. Well, I think Christ said, preach the gospel to every creature, didn't he? But wait a minute, isn't it mockery to preach the gospel? and seemingly offer salvation to people who are blinded and to whom God refuses to give the grace to believe. You know, I use the example in the Brian Call. You got a man in the bottom of a well and you're standing up above and you're holding a rope 30 feet above his head and saying, grab a hold of it. Come on, I want to pull you out of there. I mean, he'd think you were mad. I mean, he'd like to grab your throat maybe. Uh, if you want me to come out, why don't you lower it down to where I can get it? And the Calvinist says, oh, what an illustration. I mean, it's not, a, we don't hold on. Well, that wasn't the point. The point was, the man on top is obviously not sincere, is he? And for God to plead with people to repent, from whom he withholds the very grace that they need, and without it, they can't repent, and yet he pleads with them to repent, but at the same time, he withholds what they need to repent. <laughs> I don't think that's sincere. And I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. But that's what Calvinism has done.
I think it's a misrepresentation of God. Um, R.C. Sproul, it, quote, it says, quote, if some people are not elected to salvation, and obviously multitudes are not, apparently the majority are not, if broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few there be, it doesn't say few there be that God has predestined, few there be that find it. Oh yeah, but that's a mockery because you can't find it unless he gives you the grace, special grace, irresistible grace. Uh, he says, if some people are not elected to salvation, then it would seem that God is not at all that loving toward them, and it would have been more loving of God not to have allowed them to be born. Whoa. You see, now we got a problem, a very serious problem. And the atheist will throw it in your face. Why all of this suffering in the world? You believe in eternal hell? Why? I mean, if your God is too weak to stop suffering and evil, then he couldn't be God. And if he could, but he doesn't, he's a monster. That's what the atheist will throw at you. Wait a minute. It's not a question of power. Irresistible grace. The Calvinist says, are you saying that the sovereign, all-powerful God can't cause everyone he wants to believe to believe? Um, most of you, I, I don't know how long you've been getting the Breen call, but maybe it was a year or so ago, I wrote an article titled, What a Sovereign God Cannot Do. Does anybody remember that article? Well, a few people, okay. Um, wow, did I get letters. You're saying that a sovereign God can't do anything he wants to do? Well, he can't be wrong, can he? He can't fail. He can't deny himself. He can't sin. He can't lie. A lot of things a sovereign God can't do because of who he is. And love is not a matter of power. You don't point a gun at a young lady, and you, you bachelors, and say, you will love me. Okay, okay. No, love is not a matter of power. It comes from the heart. God has given us the power of choice so we can love him. He wants to win our hearts. He says, come now, let us reason together. What's the point of God reasoning with anyone? We can't understand his reasoning until he has regenerated us till he gives us the grace. And when he does that, I mean, that's, that's it. Why is he reasoning with people that he's already predestined to hell for eternity? Uh, it, uh, it turns the Bible into a charade. It, it's a um, misrepresentation, in my opinion, of God's character. Now that brings us then to one of the strangest, I think, strangest doctrines of Calvinism. Um, I didn't, I was not aware of it. All the discussions that I've had with Calvinist friends through the years, I was not aware of this. And um, it uh, rather shocked me. Um, and that is, well, let me read it to you. Only when the Holy Spirit regenerates man and makes him alive spiritually can man have faith in Christ and be saved. I quote you some others. A man is not saved because he believes in Christ. He believes in Christ because he's saved. A man is not regenerated because he has first believed in Christ, but he believes in Christ because he's been regenerated. We do not believe in order to be born again. We are born again in order that we may believe. Whoa. Does that seem a little bit topsy-turvy to anybody? Uh, I was shocked. Well, here's how they will indoctrinate you uh, in a good Calvinist college. You're my, I'm the professor. You're my introductory uh, religion class. And I say, class, how many, what, what do you think? What comes first, faith or regeneration? Oh, you say, faith, of course. Ah, wait a minute, class. Don't you understand? The natural man is dead in sin. Now, how is a dead person going to believe? 
Well, this is a little bit confused. Well, I mean, I guess you're right. I mean, yeah, you know. Uh, you know I say, don't you understand? God has to sovereignly regenerate you. He's got to give you life before you can believe. And it's only after you've been regenerated that then he gives you the faith to believe. He can't give dead people the faith to believe. Well, Jesus did say, didn't he, in John 5, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. They apparently live because they heard his voice, and they only live after they've heard his voice, and these are dead people. He's talking about dead in trespasses and in sins. In contrast to what he says next, the hour is coming, not now is, He's talking about a resurrection, when all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. Some of the resurrection of life, some of the resurrection of damnation. So the Calvinist has made a basic error. In order to impose his view on scripture, he has equated spiritual death with physical death. And you hear them talking about it all the time. A corpse can't do anything. Corpse can't believe. How can a corpse believe in Christ? Yeah, but of course can't, a corpse can't disbelieve either, can it? A corpse can't sin or be held accountable. You made a, you've got a problem. You're equating spiritual death with physical death. But a spiritually dead person is physically alive. And they have the capacity to believe. They even have the capacity to do good things. Jesus said, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. Jesus said that uh, we should do good. Didn't he say to his disciples? Even, even the ungodly do that. They know how to be good at times. Uh, there are some, I mean, how are you going to explain? Here's an unsaved man, a, a soldier, and he throws himself on a hand grenade to save the lives of his buddies. That's happened. Well, we have to be regenerated. Listen to what John Calvin said. This is where it comes from. Uh, he's, you see, where, where would they, how would they support this from Scripture? Well, John 1, 13. Which were born, not of the flesh, not of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And Calvin says, see there, you're going to be born again. It's got to be God. It's not man's will. God has to do it. I have uh, been studying this now for intensely for uh, over well, about a year and a half. I never found, I couldn't find any Calvinist writer who acknowledged that John 1.12 preceded John 1.13. They assiduously avoided, it seemed to me, Verse 12, well, let's go back to verse 11. He came unto his own, his own received him not. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the sons of God. You receive him, then you become a son. Even to those who believed in his name, then verse 13 says, which were born. Not of blood, nor the will of man, the will of the flesh, but of God. So it very clearly says, you believe, you receive Christ, then you are born. Look, I can't force myself on God. I can't make him born me again, <laughs> you know. Uh, when Jesus said, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. Well, the Calvinist takes that as a, as a great verse. But wait a minute, I have employed several hundred people in my life. I could say to any of my employees, <clears throat> you didn't choose me, I chose you. But that doesn't mean that I forced them to become my employee. They had to give their assent, right? All I'm saying is, you could not force yourself on me. I have the final say. I decide who I'm going to hire or not. But you still have to consent to this. We can't force ourselves on God. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. But it doesn't say the Father doesn't want to draw all. In fact, it does. It says he's not willing that any should perish. What does uh, 1 Peter 1, 23 say? 
being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, what? By the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Doesn't that say that I'm born again through the word? Then I believe the word, then I'm born again. But the Calvinist says, oh no, 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 you can't do that because you're dead in sin. Uh, you've got to be regenerated sovereignly by God uh, before you can um, believe. Let me just quote R.C. Sproul. I think that's the name probably you would know. Uh, infants can be born again, although the faith they exercise cannot be as visible as that of adults. Now we have another strange teaching of Calvinism. Babies are born again in the womb. Uh, and if you are the child of elect, then you are one of the elect. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can quote um, John Calvin. He says, quote, Hence it follows that the children of believers are not baptized in order that they may then for the first time become children of God, but rather are received into the church by a formal sign because in virtue of the promise, they previously belonged to the body of Christ. You understand that? He says, now, baptizing an infant whose parents are not, believe, are not one of the elect, then they become one of the elect, their sins are forgiven, and so forth. But when you're baptizing babies of the elect, you're not getting their sins forgiven, they're not being regenerated, they're not being brought into the church, they already are, because they're the children of the elect. Probably most of us didn't have that, that blessing. Um, I think it makes a mockery of the Bible. I already mentioned John 3.16, what Sunday school child would come up with the idea that Christ only died for some, that when he loved the world, um, that he doesn't mean the world, it means the elect. Choose you this day, all of his pleadings with Israel, sending his prophets, Isaiah 55, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him turn unto the Lord, he will have mercy upon him. To our God he will abundantly pardon. Um, or um, uh, Jeremiah 29, 13, uh, you will seek for me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. But no, you can't seek for God unless he regenerates you. This is what the Calvinist says. But the Bible is full of calling upon the wicked, the unrighteous, to turn to the Lord, to repent, uh, to, to seek him. We have a promise. Then they do contradict themselves. I'm quoting R.C. Sproul again. <clears throat> he says, quote, Once Luther grasped the teaching of Paul in Romans, he was reborn. Well, wait a minute. You've got to be reborn before you can grasp the teaching. But now and then, a little contradiction uh, slips out. The world, the word world, must be changed to elect in 20 scriptures. Whoever, whosoever, and all must be changed to elect uh, 16 times each. Uh, every man must be changed to elect six times. You have Luke 2, 9 through 11. Remember, the angel comes and he announces, what does he say? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to the elect. Is that what he said? Which shall be to all people. Now, wait a minute. How can, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. How can it be a great joy to people that God has already predestined to hell? So the Calvinist has to change that. All people really means the elect, you understand? We can't accept that it means all people. Uh, so uh, how do they get around this? Well, they have some techniques. I mean, what it means is all classes of people, slaves, some slaves, some royalty, you know, some aborigines, uh, some this, some that. Or they also have another uh, phrase that they use, without distinction, but not without exception. So I have a store, and I advertise in the paper, all merchandise 50% off. And you come, and there's an item you want, but I say, no, no, that's, that's full price. But, and this one's full price. 
But, but, but you said all merchandise 50% off. I didn't mean all without exception. I meant all without distinction. Some of this and some of that. Every kind of merchandise in here, some of it is 50% off. So the Calvinist says, when God so loved the world, he, he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to knowledge. Well, that doesn't mean without exception. It means without distinction. Some of this kind and some of that kind. So I think you have to begin to change the meaning of the Bible. I don't think an ordinary person uh, would, would get that. And incredibly, maybe most incredibly of all, uh, see if I can find this quote quickly. I think they've given me until 3.30, if you folks don't mind. Um, here's John Piper again. Listen, I first heard of John Piper from a friend of ours who was a missionary in Mongolia. This man has gotten around and very influential around the world. He says, we do not deny that all men are intended beneficiaries of the cross in some sense. What we deny is that all men are intended as the beneficiaries of the death of Christ in the same way. All of God's mercy toward unbelievers from the rising of the sun to the worldwide preaching of the gospel is made possible because of the cross. Every time the gospel is preached to unbelievers, it is the mercy of God that gives this opportunity for salvation. What? You're giving an opportunity for salvation to someone that God has already predestined to eternal damnation. And isn't this a wonderful manifestation of God's grace that you preach the gospel to them? Have these people gone mad? It's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. The cross, they're the beneficiaries of the cross in some sense? I said, it doesn't make sense. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, but God is kind to all because he gives the sunshine to sun, everyone, you know, and the rain. Wait a minute, I'm sorry. That's like giving a, a nice meal to a man you're about to torture to death. Oh, it's kind to give a man a nice meal. Not in that context. How could it be kind for God to give no matter how many temporal benefits to someone he has predestined to eternal damnation? Didn't Christ himself say, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Uh, but the Calvinist has to do these things. Uh, it mocks mankind. And then, of course, the problem that we mention. How do you know you want to be elect? Well, it gets into other problems here, uh, such as the Calvinist says, God only knows the future because he has predestined the future. Wait a minute. That's limiting God's omniscience. God is not omniscient if he can only know what he himself has predestined. And so they argue, if man has a free will, then he could surprise God. <clears throat> you have a teaching like that in, in America. I don't know whether it's gotten here yet. It's called The Openness View of God. Gregory Boyd, a Baptist uh, pastor, is teaching it. Uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission, maybe you're not aware of it. They have taught that for many years, uh, at least going back 30, uh, mo no, more than that, 30 years. Gordon Olson, a gentleman, was teaching it many uh, years ago. Joy Dawson has taught it for many years. God is surprised. He doesn't really know what's going to happen, but when it happens, then he, as God, he steps in and tries to deal with it. But the Bible very clearly says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the cosmos. <laughs> right? Well, how could God know everything he's going to do if he doesn't know some things that men are going to do? And then he wouldn't be able to tell in advance what he's going to do in order to respond to what man is going to do. Well, yeah, but wait a minute now. Look, if God knows what Mr. Jones is going to do tomorrow, and God can't be wrong, so what God knows Mr. Jones is going to do tomorrow, he's going to have to do tomorrow. Then how can Mr. Jones have a free will if God already knows what he's going to do? <laughs> well, the philosophers have discussed that for centuries it's a very simple problem. Uh, another one of your own, uh, John Wesley. I think about 1780, he preached a sermon in which he said, 
I mean, the man was right up to date on this for sure, uh, right up to date with modern science. The latest physicists would agree with this. Time is part of this physical universe. When the Bible says, in the beginning, I think Joe would agree with me, I hope. <laughs> it's the beginning of time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and part of what he created was time. It's part of this physical universe. God is not part of this physical universe. That's pantheism. <laughs> this universe is separate and distinct from God. He didn't create it out of himself. He created it out of nothing. So time has nothing to do with God. <laughs> He's timeless. I am that I am. And so uh, John Wesley very accurately said, God observes everything from outside. He sees past, present, and future. What is past, present, and future to us? He sees it as, as already, as it is. So the fact that God knows what Mr. Jones is going to do tomorrow does not cause Mr. Jones to do it, has no influence whatsoever upon what Mr. Jones is going to do. Well, we have a problem. How do you know you're one of the elect? You are saved eternally if you're one of the elect. I mentioned that I concluded I'm a zero-point Calvinist because I believe in eternal security for the wrong reason. Uh, let me quote R.C. Sproul, uh, who has some problems as a Calvinist. He says, a while back I had one of those moments of acute awareness, and suddenly the question hit me, R.C., what if you're not one of the redeemed? What if your destiny is not heaven after all but hell? Let me tell you, I was flooded in my body with a chill that went from my head to the bottom of my spine. I was terrified. I tried to grab hold of myself. I thought, well, it's a good sign that I'm worried about this. Uh, only true Christians really care about salvation. Then I began to take stock of my life. When I looked at my performance, my sins came pouring in my mind. The more I looked at myself, the worse I felt. I thought, maybe it's really true. Maybe I'm not saved after all. Um, Piper said, quote, our final salvation is made contingent upon the subsequent obedience which comes from faith. So you can't really know that you're saved until you're ready to die, and you can look back and say, well, I've lived a pretty good life. <laughs> no, what about the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Paul says his works are tried by fire. He doesn't even have one good work, does he? But Paul says if he had his faith in Christ, he is saved. Yet so is by fire. We're not saved by our works, and that is not the manifestation of whether we're saved or not. So I just want to remind you where we began. We've, we haven't been able to really cover the topic, but I think we cover it very thoroughly in, in the book, as thoroughly as we could in one book. All the arguments that Calvinists will engage in, all he'll go to, uh, and we do, we go to uh, Romans chapter 9. What about Esau and Jacob? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Well, it's very clear. As it is written. Where is it written? Go find out where it is written. It's only written in one place. That's in Malachi. Not in the Old Testament. Never said that in the Old Testament. And it's very clear in Malachi. It is talking about the nations descended from Jacob and Esau. It is not talking about the salvation of either individual. It's very clear what, go back, and I, I go back and I don't find that the Calvinists quote this verse where God said, before she gave birth to these, to Jacob and Esau, God said to Rebecca, two nations are struggling in your womb. The elder shall serve the younger. If that was about the two individuals, Jacob and Esau, it was a false prophecy because the elder never served the younger in their lifetime, those individuals. But it's very true of the nations that descended from them. Uh, what about Pharaoh and so forth? Well, you go into all these arguments with them and what is the goal of the Calvinists? What are all the arguments, all of the turning to the Greek and the Hebrew and and all the complexities, and they're going to just overwhelm you with, with all of this. Uh, they've studied this so, so much, and you haven't. What is the bottom line? 
all of their arguments have one purpose, to prove God doesn't love everybody, to prove Christ didn't die for everybody, to prove that God is not kind to everyone, <laughs> and in fact that he delights in sending multitudes to hell. What love is this? God is love. Love is kind. I think it's a misrepresentation of the God of the Bible, but you will have to come to your own conclusion as a good Berean. Father, thank you for your word, and Lord, we do bring before you our concern. We don't want to cause division in the church, but Father, we want to stand up for your character. It's the issue is not the sovereignty, your sovereignty. Lord, you are sovereign. You can do whatever you want to do. The issue is what do you want to do? And you've told us you're not willing that any should perish. That you so loved the world, you gave your only begotten son to die. That the world through him might be saved. And Father, we believe that and we ask that you will clarify this in the hearts and minds of many, many people. We don't want to bring division in the church. Lord, we pray uh, that many eyes would be opened to who you really are and to your great love for all. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.